Welcome. I am really appreciative of your interest in this topic today. My name is John Bagnulo. Um, really excited to talk about the importance of maximizing or increasing you or your patient's ratio of polyphenols to fructose. It's a really interesting story regarding two plant-based molecules that have such, such different effects on human physiology. Um, I'll get started here with a just brief disclosure. I'm, I serve as director of nutrition for nutritional medicinals. Um, you know, that's really my only affiliation um, with any corporate interest. And I feel that this topic today is so relevant to, to the public health at large and as well as to the critically ill because we know that polyphenols you know, play very, very important roles in human health. Um, if we were to just summarize some of those effects or their ability to protect human health, number one, you know, polyphenols have generally very high antioxidant value. So because of that, they really help preserve overall cellular health in our bodies and in patients' bodies. And they do that primarily through protecting the mitochondria and the cell membrane, as well as DNA and some of the organelles within cells. In addition to that, many polyphenols have what we call COX-2 inhibition, cyclooxygenase series two inhibition uh, activity, which we know is uh, very important for reducing or mitigating inflammation. And then a lesser known quality of polyphenols is the ability to foster a healthy microbiome by feeding uh, beneficial populations and reducing pathogenic uh, presence, which is, look, we know that for so many of our, of our population, and it, this is certainly true of the critically ill, the microbiome is a, it's, a, it's of utmost importance. And, you know, the link between polyphenol consumption and microbiome health has been well established. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago that these two plant-based molecules, polyphenols and fructose, um, have very, very different effects on human health. But what's interesting is they're both produced by plants for a specific purpose. And that's really the case with most, uh, most of the antioxidants as well as most of what we call the anti-nutrients that are, that are present in plants or plant tissues. But they have a role that will either help protect the plant, will be part of an integral plant defense system. And that's certainly the case with polyphenols as they often provide protection against ultraviolet light and some other environmental pressures. Fructose, on the other hand, is something that is really leveraged. It's produced by plants and it's leveraged by plants to entice the consumption of seeds which will then be you know, dispersed through that plant's more local and sometimes further environment, distal environments, um, as it, when seeds are consumed by animals or birds, um, the fructose, the presence of fructose that accompanies those seeds really promotes a very rapid uh, transit time through the GI, uh, loose bowel movements or, or um, in the case of you know, birds, droppings, and those really help spread the seeds throughout that environment. So you can see that both of these molecules produced by plants have, you know, very specific roles for the plant to either, you know, increase the propagation of that, of that plant in its local environment or to protect it. And that's the case with some of the more well-known uh, polyphenols in terms of what, how they serve plants, you know, anthocyanins, which are found in all of your dark blue, red, and purple um, colored fruits and, and plants. Those are, as I mentioned a moment ago, those are you know, often involved in the plant's protection against ultraviolet light. Um, another of, for instance, such as quercetin, which is you know, found in things like onions and scallions and leeks, um, you know, that has to do with uh, the use of water by plants and the competition for water with, with weeds. Uh, camphorol is a natural pest deterrent that's found in, in, in coffee, cherries, and in other fruits. 
uh, the Thujon family, which is you know really concentrated in walnuts and in the roots of 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 the walnut tree, those really suppress any type of weed competition in, in, in plants in that immediate environment. Allicin, uh, resveratrol definitely have strong antifungal properties and help protect plants from from that type of pressure. So, you know, again, these these molecules in plants are there for a reason. Um, if I were to kind of show you with a with a chart here where the polyphenols fall, so you have a variety of what we call phytochemicals. You have the carotenoids here on the far left, which offer uh, typically, you know, pigments that range from green to white, orange, yellow, red that are spread through many fruits and vegetables and other plants. Then you have these phenolics and the polyphenolics specifically, if you, you know, if you follow this under the phenolics, you'll see that you have um, really a, a wide variety of, of types of phenolics that go from flavonoids to tannins and obviously um, you know, we'll talk about several of these today in great detail, but it's a very, very big family of um, of the phytonutrient broader class of molecules. Now, all of these phytonutrients are generally what we call secondary metabolites. So when we, you know, when we look at plants, uh, you know, we generally think about the macronutrients like the protein content, the carbohydrates, which is obviously made up of things like fiber and starch and different types of sugar and the lipids. And then within all of those primary metabolites, we find these different types of what we call secondary metabolites. And that's really our, our phytonutrient um, group in the phenolics are a, a major component of that. And, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that polyphenols, as well as other phytonutrients, are often present in the tissues or in the milk products of animals that graze heavily or feed on specific plants. Now this is not the case with grain fed or feedlot raised animals, but with pasture raised meats um, and pasture raised dairy products, these polyphenols are often present in significant concentrations. So it really shows the ability for these molecules to bioaccumulate in an animal and the ability for, for animal products to also convey some of the benefits of, of these polyphenols that we're talking about. Now, polyphenols are, are a unique type of phytonutrient uh, in the fact that they are excellent electron donors. That's what makes them often very significant antioxidants. They possess anti-inflammatory properties because, as I mentioned a moment ago, they, A, have an ability to uh, suppress the production of the eicosanoids of the Series 2 variety. Uh, in some cases, polyphenols can occupy receptors that are for other molecules, whether that be a, a hormone or endocrine-based uh, molecule, and can also stop inflammation via that, that type of uh, nutritional biochemical pathway. And then another very unique aspect of these phytonutrients is the ability of, of them to really improve insulin sensitivity um, and to inhibit angiogenesis, which is, the, which is the growth of blood vessels into, a let's say, a tumor uh, or, or some type of neoplasm. So, there's a lot going on uh, with polyphenols that are often shared with other phy phytonutrients, but certainly there are many characteristics that are unique. Now, this just shows us really what a, a very classical uh, chemical structure of a polyphenol is. Multiple benzene rings, those are the six-sided rings that you see here with the presence of those double bonds, that's where the lines are doubled, and all of those um, hydroxyl ions that are attached to these multi-ring structures provide additional uh, electron donating abilities and that's donating electron is the most fundamental component of being an antioxidant and neutralizing free radicals and creating stability in the outer orbital of a, of a free radical and so these are all examples of anthocyanins these all give plants a blue purple red and sometimes even a, a very dark almost black pigment um, in the case of something like black currants and these are some of the most potent um, polyphenols when it comes to medicinal value and an ability to neutralize free radicals that have ever been studied now that's why we hear so much about these dark berries like black raspberries and uh, blueberries and obviously black currants 
but they are across all pigments. You're going to find that polyphenols are are active. Um, but when we look at the measurements of of the you know most potent polyphenols, anthocyanins are typically at the top of the list, and that's measured through something like a ORAC test. That's an oxygen oxygen radical absorption capacity test which is how much of, a, uh, of any antioxidant or substance, uh, it could be an extract, could be liquefied uh, fruits or vegetables, how, how much of a known concentration of cumene peroxide can be neutralized by one gram or 100 grams of that. And everything's always compared to Trolox equivalents, which is really looking at uh, vitamin E, uh, a comparison with vitamin E in terms of its antioxidant value. So polyphenols rank very high in one of those quantitative measures of a food that is often associated with a higher antioxidant capacity. We don't, unfortunately, to date, really have, uh, have a way of effectively quantifying anti-inflammatory uh, effects or an anti-inflammatory capacity. That, that work is being done, and researchers have been working on this for over 20 years now to try to provide us with some sort of scale. You know, how is it rosemary? We know rosemary and oregano are very potent anti-inflammatory uh, herbs. You know, how is it that they compare to some type of standardized uh, anti-inflammatory measurement? You know, whether that be through a pharmaceutical, like a, an NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, um, or that be to, let's say, a, a you know, a, a known food that would be, that would serve as a standard. But these are the way we, the ways that we currently in research measure antioxidant activity, how they relate to polyphenols. You know, polyphenols obviously aren't limited to your blue, purple, uh, and dark red berries. They're also found in many green plants. Green tea is a great example of this. You can see the similarity between uh, these polyphenols, uh, which again, many of us are familiar with if we have studied green tea or, or value green tea for its anti-inflammatory and effects and its high polyphenol content. I know matcha green tea has the highest levels of this EGCG, that's epi gallo uh, 3 gallate. That's the one which has the greatest um, anti-inflammatory properties and has been used in a variety of animal and human studies to show significant effects. Just to refresh every, everybody's, uh, you know, for, for actually everybody's understanding here of the production of icosanoids. Icosanoids are made up of prostacyclines, prostaglandins, and thromboxanes, as well as leukotrienes, which are at the very top here. And the enzyme, the cyclooxygenase enzyme, is what cleaves omega sixes from the in the form of arachidonic acid um, to be used to generate series two variety. Uh, prostaglandins, thromboxanes, leukotrienes, things that generally promote inflammation, promote clot formation, um, you know, in some cases, vasoconstriction. So all things that really help help us survive at a time of uh, crisis, injury, trauma. And then, of course, cyclooxygenase series one or three uh, enzymes promote, after cleaving the omega-3 fatty acid from our cell membranes, uh, generally in the form of EPA or eicopentanoic acid, then those make the series one and three icosanoids, which promote vasodilation, um, reduce clot formation or platelet aggregation, and are very anti-inflammatory. So we need to have a balance of these going on all of the time. Unfortunately, uh, you know, many Americans and many just humans living in the industrialized world now have diets that are very high in omega-6s, very low in omega-3s. We're actually going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to offer a webinar um, on that topic next month, which should, I think, be very insightful for people that want to learn more about this. But for those individuals who have some type of chronic infection, uh, you know, or have chronic inflammation for one reason or another, the, the consumption of polyphenols has been shown to significantly alter uh, the body's cyclooxygenase series two activity or it's in, by inhibiting that, and it can really reduce inflammation. So this is really a big part of polyphenols influence on human health. It's this inflammatory cascade that we're talking about here and how the body uses omega-6 versus omega-3 fatty acids um, in terms of that. So this is a great paper. 
uh, and we'll make all of these references available to you at the conclusion uh, of today's talk. You know, apigenin is found in parsley, and that has, you can see again, the real classic polyphenolic structure, and many folks don't know this, but apigenin found in things like parsley and oregano, very, very strong anti-inflammatory properties, as well as properties that promote bone health um, and have, you know, significant uh, positive effects on on the on the endocrine system, especially with respect to the testosterone uh, later in life. So just so many things we can say about polyphenols and where they're found. Um, but in general, they have strong anti-inflammatory properties, strong antioxidant properties, uh, and, and in some cases have really unique effects on areas of our physiology that can you know, help with a healthier aging process and a re reduction in our risk for chronic disease. Now, one area of chronic disease that I think polyphenols have received so much attention in is the area of neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and, you know, polyphenols, here's a handful of them which have been looked at for their anti-amyloid uh, plaque, amyloid tangle uh, protection. As we know, amyloids are, you know, involved in things like Alzheimer's and advanced cognitive decline and dementia, as well as in other uh, neurodegenerative diseases, polyphenols have been shown to inhibit the formation of these amyloid plaques, primarily through their antioxidative effects at the nerve cell, at that fundamental unit um, of our of brain health. So when we look at this, you know, and there are some excellent papers, this one's in oxidative medicine and cellular longevity, looking at senescence, uh, looking at healthy aging in the brain, what's required for that type of healthy aging to take place, and what often is a barrier to healthy aging. And, you know, high levels of oxidative stress, high levels of, um, you know, reactive oxygen species that are crossing the blood-brain barrier and that there's no protection against, those seem to really accelerate um, aging in the brain and all of the uh, pathology that we see that's associated with that. And so, you know, researchers have looked at animal studies very closely. We don't really have uh, as much conclusive evidence. I think it's important to say that there's not as much empirical or conclusive evidence as of yet that the consumption of, you know, one particular uh, polyphenolic rich food, uh, this is in humans, um, you know, can significantly uh, prolong a healthy brain function. But we, from animal studies, you know, there are some really, really positive findings. And some of those go back to my, um, you know, my early days in my PhD work, where at Tufts University, they showed that the consumption of things such as blueberries um, by, by rats on a regular basis really resulted in prolonged uh, brain and neurological health in comparison to those laboratory animals that did not get blueberries. And it's also been shown with things such as spinach uh, and strawberries, although to a lesser extent. So, you know, we're looking at over 30 years now of animal studies uh, suggesting that, that the consumption of polyphenolic rich fruits or vegetables can be a significant difference maker with respect to brain health and aging overall. Again, with human studies, um, because of the type of follow-up that's needed and the, you know, the really the importance of study design, we don't have that same overwhelming body of evidence that, you know, I wish we did. But I, I would say that from the limited studies that we can glean information from, there are some very positive findings here. And I, I think, you know, again, studies like the one that um, I did at the University of Maine with, with Tufts University, which was, you know, looking at the effects of blueberry consumption on women's health. There were, again, some really remarkable, remarkable observations in the blood of women consuming blueberries every day, a reduction in the amount of oxidized DNA base pairs present in their urine. Um, there are other studies as well showing, which we'll look at in a moment, showing lower levels of C-reactive protein and other markers of inflammation. So the information is out there. We just don't have the, uh, you know, the tissue samples that we're, we can take from animals uh, in this kind of research of the brain. So we're obviously not gonna do that with, uh, with, with human trials. So that's why we don't have that kind of empirical evidence that we do with animals. But again, there are some very encouraging results that have come from studies of polyphenolic rich uh, foods and their consumption in human subjects that 
would suggest uh, there is something going on here at the cellular level within that neurological system. Now, one of those molecules that is very intensely studied is resveratrol because of resveratrol's ability to um, alter CERT1, sirtuin one activation. We know that has profound effects on things such as the P53 gene and the apoptosis that comes with P53 gene expression, uh, a reduction in insulin, and all of the um, all of the endocrine cascades, so to speak, that follow with elevated insulin levels. And in possibly, it's certainly in animal studies, again, no empirical evidence of this yet with humans, but improved mitochondrial function as well as mitochondrial biogenesis, which essentially means uh, the creation of new functional mitochondria, which is really, I mean, that's what so many patients, um, you know, would benefit more from than any other change on the cellular level, possibly even more <laughs> than genetic changes, because we know the mitochondria are so pivotal to, to our health and to the health of tissues and are involved in so many different types of chronic diseases. So resveratrol in animal studies has altered CERT1 and CERT2 um, pathways and has produced very favorable effects uh, at the cardiovascular and neurological front. So that's what makes resveratrol, you know, such a fascinating molecule. And if we look at where resveratrol is found, you know, cranberries have by far uh, the highest concentration of any fruit that is commonly consumed. I mean, mulberries have certainly a very large amount of resveratrol, but they're a little more difficult to find in your average grocery store um, or produce market. Uh, lingonberries, it's the same deal, right? Lingonberries are a great source of resveratrol, but cranberries out of the more available or more common fruits here in North America, uh, they have by far the highest concentration, followed by currants, and then and then you get in, into things like blueberries. So resveratrol is a big one. Curcumin is another, uh, you know, really fascinating polyphenol. You know, it's a little unique in the fact that it does have to be made uh, more bioavailable through uh, through heating, um, as well as you consuming it with a with some sort of oil or lipid. Um, you know heating curcumin or turmeric, I should say, with a small amount of cooking oil, like olive oil or coconut oil for just five minutes, just simmering it, makes it much, much more bioavailable. And we're gonna have a much higher absorption rate and an ability to help us with things like inflammation. But curcumin has been shown when it comes to neurodegenerative diseases, as well as things such as major depressive disorder, um, it's very beneficial primarily through the anti-inflammatory effects on several different fronts. So we've talked about cyclooxygenase series. That's why you see the, um, you know, the COX-5 LOX um, box there. Endothelial nitric oxide synthetase, um, PI3KC, which is a big part of mTOR driving. That's why, you know, if you can suppress mTOR activity, often you can, you know, greatly reduce um, angiogenesis uh, effects which are that's important for everything such as macular degeneration certain types of cancer um nuclear factor kappa beta nfkb all of your interleukin uh one six and eight molecules associated with higher levels of inflammation as well as tum tumor necrosis factors so you've got so much going on here with curcumin it's one of the most it has been historically one of the most heavily studied molecules uh you know or phytonutrients in this case a polyphenol in the history of food science. And when we start to take a look at those studies, whether it's curcumin um, or it's turmeric itself, the thing that is important to note with this is that not all of these studies provided a form of curcumin that is in fact bioavailable. Some of the studies did not heat the turmeric, did not provide the turmeric with some sort of oil or lipid for enhanced absorption. And so what you see is the observations made with markers of, of inflammatory processes or oxidative stress, they often don't reflect what can be shown um, when a particular form of curcumin, either in turmeric or curcumin um, on, in its more isolated form, are provided. You know, generally there's a reduction in C-reactive protein. Generally, there's a reduction in these markers of inflammatory um, of inflammatory processes 
but that won't be observed, of course, when you know when the curcumin or turmeric is not provided in the appropriate form. So that's important to know when you look at some of these meta-analyses. Now, I've talked about inflammation a lot and about how important it is, you know, to really suppress that and how polyphenols have an ability to do that. And that, you know, we have to understand that with chronic infection, that there will be much higher levels of inflammation as well as much higher levels of reactive oxygen species because those are part of our white blood cells. Our, you know, that's how they kill pathogens through what we call this oxidative burst, which is producing large amounts of nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species to destroy virally infected cells or pathogens, you know, bacteria. And when we do that, we have an increased pool of these of these very pro-oxidative molecules that damage healthy tissues and healthy cells. And so neutralizing those is important. And in so much of the research focuses on micronutrients, things like vitamin C um, and zinc um, and some of the other um, vitamins and minerals like selenium, which have antioxidant properties. But polyphenols in most cases have significantly higher antioxidant value and a significantly greater ability to neutralize uh, these free radicals that are often generated with uh, with an immune system that's challenged with some sort of infection. So, you know, it's very important to know because chronic infections, you know, are very much widespread, whether it's gum disease, uh, you know, which we know that, you know, somewhere around a third of adults have, or it's some other type of infection um, that may last, you know, weeks to months. Um, as opposed to to years, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, you know polyphenols have the ability to weed and feed uh, and build a healthy gut, especially when it comes to feeding families of bacteria that we know are pivotal for maintaining a thick brush border or mucus layer. And one of those families of bacteria is Acromancia. You know Acromancia is a, an important microbe that we all need to have um, a healthy population of and have a greater presence of in our microbiome because acromancia will essentially stimulate the production of a thicker, more protective mucus layer uh, across our epithelial cells or our brush border. And that will protect us from you know, things such as sepsis and the production of uh, or generation of these lipopolysaccharides, which can get into our circulation. So we want to have these tight kind of have a tight gap junction between all of these cells. And it starts with having a healthy, thick mucus layer there at the gut wall and higher levels of polyphenols, such as quercetin, um, you know, as well as the anthocyanins that we've talked about in berries has been shown to really help feed acromancy and some other important um, kind of mucus uh, building families of bacteria there in the microbiome. So there's so much to be said about them on different fronts, but you know, having more of these uh, and having less of the refined carbohydrates, they're usually going in, in the opposite direction. Usually when we have a diet rich in polyphenols, it's usually a diet that's representative of whole foods, minimally processed foods, and diets rich in sugars, uh, and rich in refined carbohydrates, those are the ones which we often, you know, find are the lowest in polyphenols. So, you know, we should always ask ourselves, really, who benefits the most from polyphenols in a diet high in polyphenols? And I, you know, I think we've answered those those questions here uh, on the first part of this conversation. It's those with chronic inflammation or who have inflammatory based conditions, and sometimes we can see that uh, clinically. Outside of their symptoms, we can also, you know, see that with things like, such as a, an elevated C-reactive protein. You know, patients with chronic infections, both acute, meaning that, you know, everyone's aware of that infection, and subacute, which is, again, gum disease is a great example of a subacute infection where people have that throughout their life, and it is always generating more free radicals and putting them at a greater risk for things like heart disease. And then those individuals that have high levels of intestinal permeability um, and are having a breakdown of that kind of gut wall barrier. So in summary, um, you know, who benefits the most from a diet high in polyphenols? It's certainly the critically ill, where you usually have, uh, you know, more than one of these things going on at the same time.
these are, and this is a great paper. Uh, if you want to look at a paper that looks closely at those foods that are the richest source of polyphenols, um, the European Journal of, Clini of Clinical Nutrition uh, 2010 paper is it's a supplemental it's eight to nine pages on on polyphenol rich foods. This is one of the best papers out there. You can see that we've talked about several of these, but you know cloves and cocoa, uh, pecans and flaxseed. These are not ones that we've mentioned as of yet. And extra virgin olive oil can have very high polyphenol contents. Um, some of the work that I've done over my career as a consultant, um, you know, we've tested extra virgin olive oils that have had polyphenol counts in the in the 800s which is incredible if you're talking about a an oil that you could use for everything from salad dressings to uh, sauteing vegetables so that can also be a very significant source of polyphenols at the end of the day how do we optimize polyphenol intake well number one incorporate the four major families that contribute the largest amounts of polyphenols those would be your spices things like turmeric and ginger, um, dark berries, the darker typically, the higher the polyphenol content, uh, herbs such as, as we mentioned, oregano, you know, basil, parsley, rosemary, sage, and thyme, all excellent examples. And then dark green leafy vegetables, kale, you know, especially lacinato kale, Swiss chard, spinach, beet greens, all contain high levels of different types of polyphenols. Choose whole, minimally processed, brightly colored fruits and vegetables because as we process them, both through heat, as well as in the breakdown of various components and the removal of, of the skins of, of, of plants, for instance, we tend to strip those, uh, those vegetables and fruits of their highest antioxidant uh, concentrations. Use extra virgin olive oil for most of our cooking um, because it is one of the greatest sources of polyphenols across that group of food. And then use flaxseed oil whenever possible, but you have to keep that obviously away from um, high heat and even moderate heat applications. And then em emphasize organically grown sources. And I say this because as I mentioned earlier, you know, these polyphenols are natural pest deterrents. They're natural antifungal um molecules they offer protection for plants against various environmental pressures and when we start to spray plants uh, and, and again the, you know university of california at davis you know uc davis is they published several papers on this in the journal of agriculture and food chemistry looking at the polyphenol content of uh, of different foods which are grown conventionally integrative pest management organic and what what they've shown is that the less intervention in the way of pesticide application, herbicide application, you know, fungicides, then the higher the polyphenol content because the plant is really kind of um, taking that responsibility on its own with the molecules that it produces. So, you know, emphasizing organically grown sources of vegetables and fruits and as, as well as herbs and, and spices is, is something else that we can do to really maximize the polyphenol content of the foods that we eat and choose to choose to make part of our diet. So these are four important steps to get us to a higher polyphenol content. Now, the flip side of this with the, the, the molecule found in plants that we have to really try to limit as much as we can is fructose. And this is a, you know, I always find this topic to be one of the most fascinating on uh, topics on several fronts, but a lot of it has to do with just kind of the misinformation that's out there and has been um, has been out there for a long time, which is that you know sugars are all essentially created the same, right? They're all give us the same amount of calories. They kind of do the same things to our blood sugar levels, and you know that we want to just be careful with sugar in general. They're all about the same. Well, that's definitely not the case. Um, you know, fructose is by far the sugar that human physiology has the most difficult time metabolizing in a safe and healthy fashion. So that's, that's been well established. And the reason being is that fructose, before it can be used by our bodies and our cells, it has to be phosphorylated. That means that the liver, when fructose is presented to the liver, the liver is going to have to come up with a phosphorus to drive this phosphorylation reaction. That's gonna come from the ATP stores there in the liver. When that happens, 
it generates uric acid. And uric acid is not something that you know, we should limit our concern around with respect to gout. Uric acid has been tied very closely to higher levels of inflammation, um, higher you know, rates of angiogenesis, and again, fatty liver deposits, and overall, it's a less healthy um, you know, hepatic burden, so to speak. So we want to do everything we can to reduce uric acid presence in the liver. We want to do everything we can to facilitate um, the production of larger LDLs, not small, dense LDLs, which we know fructose drives. Fructose tends to produce higher levels of triglycerides in comparison to glucose and small, dense LDLs, which, you know, that's really the culprit with heart disease, as well as glycation. Uh, fructose is going to result in much, much higher levels of advanced glycosylated end products, uh, which we're going to take a look at in a moment. And so, you know, really the, the big picture here is that we have challenges with respect to fructose, especially when it's consumed at the levels that it is right now in North America and here in the United States. Uh, you know, we have really, we have a pretty good idea as to how much people are consuming, which is around three times what they can safely consume. Um, you know, we're, we're consuming more than 75 grams per day as an average American. And the research by people like Robert Lustig and others who are experts on, on fructose and the effects it has on human health would suggest that we can only really handle about 25 grams per day before the liver starts to suffer in one or more ways. So it's a, it's a challenge. Again, if we go back to the basics, it's all about fructose being unique in the fact that it requires this phosphorylation. Um, you know, that's going to take place in the liver and that's going to have byproducts of that phosphorylation that are tough for us to deal with. And uric acid is the big one there. You know, just if we look at some kind of you know, again, food intake uh, studies and observations. This is the one in a 2008 Diabetes Care Journal, which showed how much fruit juice consumption increases the, the hazard ratio for developing diabetes. You know, you have one eight ounce cup of fruit juice per month. There's no difference. You have one to four per month or one a week one glass of fruit juice per week, now we've got an increase to 1.25. And you get up to, as you can see here clearly, you know, you start to get up to having two or three per day and you start to approach that 1.5 hazard ratio. So it's, it's really clear that fruit juice is not compatible with human physiology and an ability to safely metabolize fructose. This is a real eye opener for folks who think that you know, fruit juice is something we got to maybe cut back a little bit on, but that it, it is well tolerated. It's definitely not. Now, obviously, there's different levels of fructose in different juices. So we're not talking about tomato juice there as much as we are things like apple juice and um, maybe the higher fructose, uh, you know, fruit juices. Here's another. Uh, this is a Stanhope paper, which I think is really eye opening, looking at the change in fructose generated triglycerides compared to glucose generated triglycerides and you can see that um, with modest amounts of fructose versus glucose you have radically different levels of triglycerides and then right there in the center your lowercase sd small dense ldl molecules are roughly three times as high with the fructose uh, dose oral dose than they are with the glucose and again Fructose is so misunderstood because people often think that, well, it's got a low glycemic index. It's got to be healthy. Well, look, the glycemic index measures how much a food raises our blood glucose levels. Well, fructose isn't going to, it's not going to raise our glucose levels because it's not glucose. It's fructose. So that's why the glycemic index, the glycemic load, they don't really tell us anything about fructose's effects on human health. When we look at what it does to the liver, when we look at what it does to the types of lipids that our liver produces and sends out into circulation, that's when we all take kind of the, have that big aha moment. Wow, it really does, you know, cause some very, very significant changes in cardiovascular health, our risk for diabetes, uh, and in hepatobiliary health overall. And one of those molecules related to the uric acid, which I've been talking about, is methylglyoxal. 
So this methyl glyoxyl, which is generated again, is a byproduct of this phosphorylation a little bit further down the, the pathway here. Methyl glyoxyl uh, as a molecule really is, you know, an amazing surrogate marker for advanced glycation end products in advanced stages of diabetes. And this comes, this methyl glyoxyl is present with larger and larger amounts of it's directly related to the amount of dietary fructose that a person's consuming. And we know how damaging it is to DNA and, and the changes it causes with respect to epigenetics. It's very damaging to the mitochondria because of the os oxidative stress um, that it drives. So methyl glyoxyl is a molecule in this paper. If you want to, all of these, again, all of these references will be made available to you to dig deeper into some of these subjects if you're interested. But this methyl glyoxyl effect of fructose is one that, you know, is now being looked at as maybe one of the most beneficial and telling biomarkers of diabetes because of how it uh, persists in human physiology, how, how it stays in our bodies for long periods of time after we have larger amounts of fructose and we are challenged metabolically by the fructose in our diet. And again, it's, um, it's just so damaging. It's an example of an age molecule. That's what you see at the center here of this uh, sphere, advanced glycation end products, which is why we measure, right? It's why we measure um, the, you know, the hemoglobin A1C. That, that's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at uh, a glycation end product related to red blood cells, which we know lasts roughly 90 days. So it gives us a long-term picture of the glycation associated with someone who has insulin resistance and how much they've had that under control. Um, because it's a long-term kind of a big picture, 90-day picture. So this is something that could provide even greater long-term um, summary type, uh, you know, assessment of a patient's glycemic control and the amount of glycation that's been present. So it's a big part of fructose. It's a big part of the fructose problem is how it drives these age molecules and how it contributes methyl glyoxal, uh, you know, into to our bodies as a whole. Now, I've mentioned this once before, I'll say it again. The body will have a challenge with respect to how much fructose it can metabolize regardless of where that fructose is coming from. Meaning that the fructose from apples or the fructose from mangoes or dried fruit is going to provide us with a challenge, even though it may be from a fruit. It doesn't have to come from things like high fructose corn syrup uh, or refined fructose as a sweetener. And this paper, which is in, again, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition 2018, showed that uric acid levels reflect fructose consumption, regardless of whether it was apples, apple juice, um, or other sources of, of fructose. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great paper. It's a great paper to look at, you know, fruit as a whole, you know, maybe how it is we recommend fruit for our patients, especially patients who have, you know, some sort of challenge either at the, with the liver or with insulin resistance, but for the broader, healthy, healthier population as well. These are the fructose contents of some fruits. You know, typically if you get under 7.5, you know, blueberries are right, right there. Um, you get under that and you're in a kind of what we call a lower fructose content. This is per cup. Um, and then you get to things like raisins where you got more than 40 grams um, in a serving. You've got a, just a really very, very different picture here in terms of um, the challenge that those two uh, fruits in particular would, would pose. So again, that's a great paper that is going to be part of your references if you want to look more closely at this, because I think it's one of the more common misunderstandings around fructose is that if it comes from fruit, it's fine and it's well tolerated. And, and we just, and we know that's not the case. And certainly people who are diabetes specialists have observed that as well over the last several decades. So there are good choices though. Citrus fruits and berries are generally always um, your best choices when it comes to the lowest fructose contents. Here are some of those references um, that will be made available. And then some clinical considerations here before I do my best to answer your questions this afternoon. Number one, avoid the use of sweeteners. If you are going to use a sweetener, you know, something like stevia, um, I think is a, it's for the most part a win-win. 
because it really doesn't contain any fructose or any free sugar uh, for that matter. And it can often add a certain level of, of sweetness to some foods, um, you know, really jives with certain foods, obviously not all, but that would be, you know, one of the top clinical considerations. Obviously choose, as I just mentioned, the lower fructose containing fruits, you know, go with those which we, we know are just, a, you know, a couple grams of fructose per cup as opposed to those which are in the double digits. Uh, avoid fruit juice and dried fruits altogether. And for those patients that you feel have issues, and one of the first signs that I would often get as a clinician for a patient would be, you know, someone who's eating three or four servings of fruit a day and their triglycerides were very high. I would say that's an individual for one reason or another whose liver just can't handle the amount of fructose that's being presented with daily. So seeing high triglycerides is often a, a red flag and that may, you know, that may be a situation where you want to do subsequent testing and ask for a uric acid test, which is very inexpensive and usually there's no opposition to that type of testing because uric acid levels that are over 5.7 um, with a generally healthy diet often reflect that there is an issue uh, with fructose metabolism in that in that individual. And then really based on, again, researchers such as uh, Softic and, and, and Dr. Lustig, which I've mentioned before, and some of the papers that will be in this reference list will show you this, um, less than 10 grams, 10 grams or less per meal, and less than 25 grams per day is what can be safely handled by most adults. It can be significantly less for a small child or in a pediatric population. So those are a few considerations here to take home. Um, these are references that are very specific to fructose and its overall, um, you know, the challenge, especially in pediatric, uh, in pediatric health, how many children are suffering from just higher than tolerated levels of fructose and how it's not only causing diabetes and obesity, but things like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in young children. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's something that we need to as clinicians and as educators, you know, whether it's for our loved ones or the patients we work with, it's something that we really have to try to wrap our heads around because we know that, you know, it's not just soft drinks, it's not just fruit juice. Uh, fructose is so insidious, it, it makes its way into our food supply and into, onto a child's plate, specifically when that pediatric uh, area of public health. Um, and we've seen now for the last three decades how it's really taken its toll on, on our children's health. So it's something I'm very passionate about and I encourage you to look at these papers and to, uh, when you work with your patients, uh, again, regardless of their age and, and the demographic, you know, I, I would say be more vigilant around fructose uh, and do all that you can to increase the population's consumption of polyphenols um, in any way you can. Find the foods that they like that are rich in polyphenols and hopefully some of those can displace uh, the foods which are unfortunately higher in, in fructose. So with that, as always, I really enjoy, you know, talking about this material with you. And I, at that, this time, I'll hopefully answer some of your questions. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, John. Um, so this is Laura. I'm going to field some of the Q&As. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so I unfortunately we will not get to all of them. But we do plan on following up this webinar with a blog um, on our website to answer some of the questions we don't get to. So that's something new. We're gonna try um, to look out for an email when that is completed. But John, let's get started with, um, so there's a lot of questions on here about turmeric. Um, so this is kind of multi question that I'm gonna ask together, but they all kind of run together. So you mentioned that turmeric and the role of heat is important in terms of increasing bioavailability. So does simply just taking turmeric the spice and adding it to hot water, is that enough heat? Or what level of heat are we talking about? And to bounce off of that, someone else asked, does the curcumin have to be heated with oil to make it more bioavailable? Those are great questions. 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, somewhere around 90 to 92 degrees Celsius, when you get into that area, you start to really change the bioavailability. So it doesn't have to be um, boiling, but it has to be really hot, um, not the kind of water that comes out of a faucet, per se. I think simmering turmeric 
simmering turmeric in a small amount of oil or in some medium that contains a lipid. I know that in India, for instance, it's often done with whole milk, which has a significant lipid content, you know, six to seven percent. That results in the greatest bioavailability. Now, there will be some improvements with just the use of like hot water, definitely, um, but that will only help convert the curcumin mo molecule. It will still have to be combined with some kind of oil when consumed because it is an, it's it just, it's important to keep in mind, it is an oil, um, it's an oil based molecule, oil solid oil soluble fat soluble we know about fat soluble vitamins it's much the same here it's a fat soluble uh, polyphenol okay in in regards to other polyphenols do they all require heat for bioavailability do some of them not others and how is there a good reference to know which ones apply to heat re relative and which ones do not yeah no they're definitely not all um heat activated in fact, your anthocyanins, which are found in the berries that we're, you know, we spent a good time talking about, those are not tolerant of high heat. So those you actually want to keep away from that boiling process. They're, they're much better if consumed fresh or frozen. So it's not, uh, it's not easy to just, you know, for me to list all the ones that are, um, that are heat activated and those that aren't. I, that paper that I did share with you on on polyphenol sources, the top sources, that gets into that some. There are some papers in the Journal of Agricultural Agriculture and Food Chemistry that do uh, categorize or classify them as heat activated versus non. So it just really depends on the plant. But in general, in general, your anthocyanins and the skins of berries and those fruits, those are not heat, heat tolerant. Um, whereas those which are found in some of your spices, things like cloves, uh, you know, turmeric, ginger, those those types of spices tend to be more heat activated, but that's a generalization. Okay, thank you. And speaking of berries, do blueberries, cranberries, the, all the berry family, do they maintain their levels of polyphenols um, when they're preserved, so like dried, frozen? Uh, frozen, yes. Flash frozen would be ideal, but it's not even, it's not essential. Um, when it gets into the area of dried, it depends on how they're dried. So if they're freeze dried, yeah, because it's a, a fairly rapid, um, less exposure to oxygen. If they're something like sun dried, they, they tend to lose a significant percentage. They can still have a very high concentration because keep in mind, um, whenever you dry anything, then the concentration of nutrients per 100 grams goes up as the water goes down so you know dried dried berries can still have a can still have a significant polyphenol content um but generally it's not as as high as it would be fresh or frozen great um Someone commented that they were surprised to see the significant amount of resveratrol in peanuts. Do tree nuts also contain resveratrol or, and are they a good source? Uh, peanuts are really, you know, peanuts are a legume. Um, they're more like a, a bean in terms of how they grow. Uh, resveratrol is not as high in tree nuts. Um, it's, you know, there's small amounts in some, but chestnuts and pecans and, um, you know, hazelnuts, also known as filberts, those have they just have low low to modest levels they do have some very high polyphenol contents though so chestnuts pecans hazelnuts high polyphenol contents but not really significant or high levels of resveratrol resveratrol is really uh it's more of an antifungal compound so it's going to be it's going to be more present in um, plants which have a, a greater kind of threat or pressure from from fungi, so it's not in all tree nuts. And what about avocado oil? Would you say that is a um, food that has a high polyphenol content? Not really. No, the processing of avocados to make avocado oil unfortunately eliminates the majority of the polyphenols that are present there. And two questions about artificial sweeteners, and then we'll switch over to answering some questions about fructose. Is stevia classified as an artificial sweetener by definition, and does it promote inflammation? No, it does not 
uh, does not fall into the categorization as an artificial sweetener. Um, and no, it does not promote inflammation. So no to both of those. Okay. And what are your thoughts regarding allulose as a sweetener? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I think that allulose as well as some of the sugar alcohols are they're they're very interesting. I mean, xylitol is a sweetener that appears to be very safe. Um, you know, excellent for glycemic control. Actually, may have some favorable effects on the microbiome. Allulose, we don't know quite as much about, um, but I would say that the early observations with allulose has also shown it to have, I think, the potential to be a healthier sweetener. Um, moving on to fructose. And like I said, if we didn't get a chance to answer some of your polyphenol related questions, um, we will be doing a blog on it for any of the ones that weren't answered. Um, but fructose. So I think a lot of the questions are ranging about, you know, as RDs, how do we recommend a high fruit diet, but also balancing the fructose? Is there a balance between glucose and fructose? Someone mentioned a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, you know, isn't there benefit to recommending a high fruit, a high fruit diet? You know, what's most important, I think is the biggest thing here is how do you get people to take their fruit and get all the polyphenols from the fruit, but also limit the fructose? Like, what does that look like in terms of serving sizes of fruit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. It's a, it's a big question. It's one that, you know, I think that all of us should spend more time thinking about. And I think that there should, should be a, a concerted effort by RDs and, and public health uh, public health efforts across the country to really, you know, come up with a, a different message. We've been saying eat more fruits and vegetables now for four or five decades. And I think we might want to say eat more vegetables and fruit. I'd say that first. It doesn't, you know, again, this is not to say that you can't eat fruit in a healthy fashion, but I hope I made it clear in the presentation that things like citrus fruits and berries were really low fructose. You could have a couple servings of those a day. I, I don't think we need people to eat lots of fruit. I think we need people to have modest amounts of fruit. That might be two servings. It might be three servings, depending on the type of fruit. Um, and I, obviously, it's a function as well as, a, as a, of an individual's state of health uh, and, and preferences. I mean, I think three bananas per day for many people, even people that don't have diabetes, I think it's too much. I think three apples a day is too much for many people, three pears a day. But I think three tangerines, I think that's really well tolerated by most folks, even people with diabetes. You know, so that's where understanding that not all fruits are created equally, helping people understand that dried fruit should not be considered a fruit, despite the fact that the USDA labels it that for other purposes, right? For the fiber content, maybe for the potassium content. I mean, there are obviously some excellent attributes of fruit across the board, but then when you take into account the fructose that's presented, some make a much, much better, uh, much better choice than others for, for people. So again, I, you know, I don't want this to come across that I'm saying don't eat fruit. I, you know, I really, try to you know provide as much information as I could around the fructose content and how much is, has been shown to be tolerated and can be you know incorporated into a healthy diet and you know Robert Lustig look his whole career has been centered on the endocrine changes produced by added sugar and fruit juice and the fructose content of both kids and adults diets uh, you know as well as some of the other researchers that I've shared papers with and it's really clear we're eating too much fructose, period, regardless of where it comes from. You know, fruit juice is something we can really kind of put our crop, put the crosshairs on and say, yeah, like we got to reduce fructose consumption via fruit juice. But, you know, that's, you know, it's almost one and the same. We start talking about fruit purees and dried fruit and some of the fruit that is really high in fructose. Let's just try to displace some of those fruits for the patients and the populations that we work with with things like grapefruits and tangerines and berries. And, you know, I think we can really have the best of both worlds where, you know, the people that we care for are getting all of the wonderful polyphenols and other nutrients that are found in some of these, these certain fruits without the challenge of the fructose. But 
I think it should be vegetables and fruit, eat more vegetables and fruit as opposed to eat more fruits and vegetables. Okay, totally agree there. Last question. Do you know of any, and I know you provided a really good reference for the polyphenols. Um, do you have a really good reference or maybe even an app where there's a list of fructose foods um, or even like the app, like I mentioned for like clients or patients to use, do you know if that exists? Yeah, there are. There are a couple different resources on fructose. Um, they're not apps, you know, one of them, um, pretty sure is through the Robert Lustig Foundation, but you know, I don't have an app per se on a phone. Um, the USDA actually provides the fructose content of all fruits and vegetables that's available through the USDA database. That's probably the one that I would recommend simply because it's, I feel like it's got the most accurate data and science behind it. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and Dr. Bagnulo for your time and knowledge. Um, it was amazing. I will plan on having everyone's continuing professional education unit um, certificate out to them by Friday at the latest, um, hopefully today or tomorrow, but by Friday at the latest. If you do not receive your CEU certificate, Please reach out to us. Sometimes it ends up in your spam folder or because it's a mass email, it, it doesn't get through the firewalls of your institution. So again, next Monday, if you don't have it yet, please, please reach out to us so that I, you can get credit for it. And this will be recorded and available um, within one to two weeks on our website. And like I mentioned, we will be doing a blog to help answer as many of the Q&As we didn't get to as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bagnulo, and I hope everybody has a great day. Hey, thank you so much, Laura, and thanks, everyone. Take care.